Um, basically, that's it. I just wanted to go over to make sure that you have the right equipment when you go. We're probably not going to sit down. We're going to be walking. We'll stop five minutes, what, 15 minutes, maybe a half an hour. What do you say, Chris? Something like that? Oh, yeah. yeah, 30 minutes at the max. At the max. So there'll yeah. be quick sketches. So you want to travel light. If you need to sit down, uh, bring yourself a little um, stool. This weighs like nothing. And I actually got one that was 21 inches tall. So it's a really nice little pops right out and then you can put it back together. Um, you know, carry your stuff in a light. I picked up an old pocketbook, a pocketbook at Marshall's and it's perfect. It has, you know, you can put your uh, pens and things there and your um, sketchbooks in the middle and then it's nice and light. So something like that, whatever you pick up, all kinds of sketchbooks you can use, you know, just something like make sure you have a book, not pages, because you want to open the book up. You want to open the book up and do a sketch, you know, you want to stand there and do a sketch. So um, just hold it. This one is an accordion one, you know, so there's accordion ones. My favorite one is uh, this Strathmore. I really like it. It's uh, got a soft cover and you can easily, you know, just open it up and hold it and it's very stable. If you want something a little more stable, there's hard covered ones, you know, if you don't want anything that big, nice little guys like this is wonderful. <laughs> so, you know, there's no limit. So it's easy, make it easy on yourself. My very best favorite, and you're all gonna say it's a no, no. I love this mixed media one. I love the size of it. And believe it or not, I really like the paper. I like what watercolor goes on it. So it's your personal preference. You can bring uh, just a pen. You can, bring, um, you can bring something that has all your pens on it. I made this for myself. So I have all my pens in this, I roll it up. Basically though, I basically bring this that has my micro pens in it. That's what I like, micro pens. And then I bring these, these little aqua brushes because I don't want to carry water. So I bring an aqua brush and they're really easy. You fill them with water. They work really great. You know, the nice little brushes. I really enjoy them. And you can get different ones, you know, there, there's all kinds. And uh, if you really like, um, what are these called, darn it? <laughs> these pens, this is a sailor, you know, so uh, these yeah, those are the Fuda, the Fuda point, yeah. Pens. Yeah, the Fuda point pen, yeah. um, those are great. I have another little one, this was actually my father's, I've had it many, many years, very fine point, just a straight one. That one's a, a fun one to use. Something I always carry too is I carry one of these, it's black. So you can get your black shadows in real quick or if you, it's nice and thick. And then if you don't wanna carry watercolors, these flare pens that are water um, soluble. So you can carry a bunch of colors if you want. Um, I did, a painting with three colors. Let me show you to show you how. Okay, this is a three color flare pen painting. So I used, uh, let's see if I got my colors. I used two greens. Where are my greens? I used these two greens. Can you see it? Oh, yeah. These two greens and a black. Mm -hmm. And then I just used water pen and it put it together. So you don't have to make it complicated and carry least, the least amount. You know, you'd be amazed if you just do pen and ink, you just have fun. We prefer you to do pen and ink because you have to commit and we want you to commit. We want you to just put it down, make a mistake, draw over it, enjoy it. But there's also this wonderful thing. This is a soluble graphite pen. 
and I really like these too. So you can do a, a, a pencil. I don't erase with this. I'll just draw uh, just like you do with a pencil. And then I use my water pen and it's a soluble graphic. It looks great. It's really fun. I can't think of anything else. Oh, there's the fancy pens that Chris carries, the fancy brushes that they close and then you carry water with you. It's all personal preference and what you get used to. So, and you won't know what you get used to until you get out there and really start doing it. So hopefully we can really, now that the pandemic is starting to get control, oh, we can get out there more. The last thing I wanna show you is I just carry a little um, mm -hmm. watercolor set, just, um, mm -hmm with the colors that I that I like to use. So and that's it. I don't I don't know what else I can tell. And anybody have any questions? Yes. What's the uh, name brand of that stool? Because I need, need to sit some. And that's this is um, a GCI outdoors. I got it at a camping store. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And take a look at them too, because it's better to get one that's taller. So look at a, a lot of them are like only like 15 inches tall. And if you got bad knees, it's not a good thing. So we found one 21 inches, they're out there. So just take a look. Thanks. You have plenty of time to find something. So any other questions? Hey Lisa, <clears throat> hey there, it's Laura. Hi, Laura. Hi, everybody. Hey, great demo. I'm a, an equipment junkie, so I appreciate all the information. You know, you always learn something every single time from someone and their favorite um, stuff. So thank you. Um, I guess my question, it's maybe obvious, but how do you manage with watercolor, for example, when you have to stand? You know, you're juggling your book. You've got perhaps a pen or something in your hand. Now you've got watercolor, which requires kind of two hands. Now that's three hands. <laughs> how are you? I have one more thing. How do you juggle all that when you're trying to stand? You know, it, it, I if see, you don't I'm have a stool. Step away for a minute because I forgot that one more piece of equipment. <laughs> Great question, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> She's got a third hand in her studio. <laughs> I know when we do a um, metal smithing, we have a thing called a third hand. I thought maybe we have one. This is a um, mm. piece of masonite. Okay. Like a drawing board almost, yeah. So you can just put it against you. You can ah. put, your, put everything on it. So it's, my husband cut it out for me. It's just the right size. Nice. So you can make it whatever size you're comfortable with. I like masonite because it's so lightweight. And this one has that, um, the side that's um, finished so that it doesn't get wet. Right. So, you that's something that you can carry it's light so and you could probably clip your things on it somehow figure out a way to you know kind of clip a baggie with your supplies and yeah 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 <laughs> and brilliant all kinds of clips so it's really a handy really a handy dandy thing nice thank you okay anything else lisa who makes the soluble graphite pen Ah, that's a good question. I've got a bunch of them here. Um, uh, Derwent makes it. Mm. Derwent. Yeah. And they come in different, um, like uh, this is an 8B. They come all the way down to, you know, 2H, whatever. I got different um, softness because, you know, because sometimes you like it softer and sometimes you like them sharper points. Okay. Do the softer yes. ones have, do they make, this may be a stupid question, but do the softer ones make a darker? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, okay. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? All right. I'm so excited. Now I'm going to let Chris take this because we have a wonderful speaker today. You're, I've been listening to podcasts all day. So, <laughs> so Chris, take it away. All right, Lisa. Well, thank you. And, and you know, welcome, everybody. It's good to see everybody tonight. 
is, you know, Zoom will we'll take it. We'll take what we can get these days. And it's uh, always, always a pleasure, especially some of the new faces. So we appreciate that. Uh, all Lisa showed me is that I need to go shopping. You know, I, I have a lot of stuff too. Uh, doggone it. And she just got me all fired up to go get some more stuff. So we never can have enough pens. We never can have enough paper. We never have the right paper. We never have the right pens. But as long as you're drawing, that's, that's what it's all about. And uh, that's that's what we're here to, to listen to tonight. You know, Lisa mentioned we I'm excited as well. And, and thank you, Anna, for for really making this contact with our guest speaker tonight. I'm going to just give a, a short introduction. But, you know, sometimes I draw it out as well. But I love to draw. What can I say? But, you know, uh, Nishan was someone that uh, that I ran across. Uh, those of you who were part of our last month's uh, meeting, we we had Merrick uh, Bedensky, who who's a tremendous urban sketcher, and we had had him do a little demo. and And Merrick's just full of personality. And I ran across uh, Nishant with with uh, with one of uh, Merrick's contacts. Uh, uh, he was actually on a podcast that uh that nishant hosts and i'll go into that in a little bit as well uh and and tuned in and and uh listened to the podcast and i was so impressed with the depth of question and and really with the expansive knowledge that when you put two really talented urban sketches together and they start talking about their craft man i'm telling you it's poetry and it was it's always wonderful to hear the story it's always wonderful to make that connection and, and, and hear what drew people to the urban sketcher community. You know, we're a different bunch uh, because you don't have to be technically uh, 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 trained. You don't have to be technically oriented. You just have to love to draw. And so that's what's so fascinating about it. Some of the most talented are, are the less trained. And, and that's, that's what's, uh, what's fantastic as well. A little bit about Nishant, and, and I'll do the formal intro here in a minute. Nishant, sorry, sorry, man. I I ran across him, and 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 certainly uh, following him, him on Instagram is one thing. Uh, but if you have not had an opportunity to listen to his podcast, and he's going to pimp it a little bit too later, but I'm going to pimp it first. It's called Sneaky Art Podcast. Podcast, and actually, just before we we tuned in, I was can't quite uh, see see it but I was uh you know the phone I was listening to Liz Steele because Liz uh, was an architect that became uh, well just sort of quit architecture and became a full-time urban sketcher and that's always a fascinating story because I know we have a couple of architects on tonight Chris Allen if you're listening uh, we still have a chance but you know the 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 questions and and really the, the the fascinating backgrounds of each urban sketcher. Everyone has a narrative. Everyone has a story, and it's it's fun to hear Nishant take that uh, take that to a level of of conversation that all of us can enjoy. Um, you know, uh, we want to talk a little bit about what urban sketching is all about. What's the philosophy of urban sketching? And and Anna and and uh, and Lisa and I had an opportunity last night to have a little pre-call with, with Nishan and his philosophy on, on what urban sketching is all about is fascinating. Uh, Nishan, you didn't know it, but after we hung up with you, Anna and Lisa and I kept messaging each other. We were so <laughs> fired up about, about hearing, hearing you uh, go into your, your, your journey and, and really as an urban sketcher, fascinating indeed. So, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to continue to hog the airtime. I want to get uh, get directly to our special guest tonight from Vancouver, Canada, right now. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but uh, Nishan Jen is someone who uh, who will you will learn to like very quickly, and uh, and and we're all looking forward to hearing about his journey uh, and his life now as an urban sketcher, uh, podcaster, uh, author. Uh, all around uh, good guy, so Merrick says. So Nishant, welcome to the Jacksonville Urban Sketcher community. And we certainly look forward to hearing from you tonight. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Chris. This was quite an intro. Uh, I asked Chris to uh, write his own intro for me yesterday. I said, I won't tell you what to say. I just want to hear what you're going to say. And this was worth it. <laughs> good job. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. Um, 
we were talking about uh, about why I'm an urban sketcher and what I enjoy about urban sketching. And it's it's something that I love to share with other people, and it's something I love to I love to explain to others so that I can sort of better understand it myself. Because I'm an artist now, uh, but I used to be an academic. I used to be an engineer before this, and I wasn't. I'm not trained to be an artist. I'm an artist because I really want to be one. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about why I want to do this, and if there's any point to me doing this. And I apply that idea to the things I draw. I think about why I'm drawing them. I think about why I drew them a certain way with certain tools. And what's the point of it? Who cares? And these are things that are running through my mind whenever I go out to draw things. And they sort of dictate the subjects that I choose and the way that I draw them, the kind of time I give myself, the, the tools I use. And um what qualifies as a good or a bad sketch then is if it meets those different criteria and urban sketching just absolutely works for me so perfectly that I, I love doing it almost every day Manisha, tell us a little bit about you you know you what you have really done tell us about your journey you talked about you know chicago in 2016 yeah. they International uh, Urban Sketcher Symposium there, and, and you said you've sort of just been sketching since then. But you know, your background is fascinating. You're 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 a mechanical engineer. You're trained as a mechanical engineer. Is that is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, I studied to be a mechanical engineer in India, and then I did a master's degree in the Netherlands. So I lived in this little town of Delft for five years. That's it's famous for Vermeer. Vermeer is from Delft. And I lived there for five years to do a master's degree in mechanical engineering, and I started a PhD program. But all the time, I always wanted to do a lot of creative things, and I did a lot of creative things on the side. So I've always been a writer all my life, and I've written stories, and I've written poems, and all kinds of things, and I kept doing that. And I st had started to draw a webcomic uh, just as another way to write things. But I didn't know how to draw for the longest time. And I used to draw stick figures. <laughs> and then in 2016, I was in Chicago. After I quit my PhD program, I decided that I was going to be a writer full time and uh, somehow find a way to make it work. So I was in Chicago and I was wandering around and I was thinking to myself that I need to learn how to draw because I'm really terrible at drawing. And I've tried all my life, but it hasn't worked for me. And I always thought Chicago was this, it, it was just the most beautiful city that I've seen. Just the architecture, the, the variety of the people, the kind of life you see. Just as an artist, it had inspiration everywhere. And I told myself that this is how I'm going to learn. I'm going to get a sketchbook and I'm going to walk around and I'm going to see this new city that I don't know. I don't understand what happens where, how it goes. And I'm going to try to understand it by drawing it. And by drawing it, I will hopefully also learn how to draw. And it, it worked. So uh, I started doing it in this practice that I called sneaky art, which was motivated by two things. I firstly, and probably the more important reason was that I didn't want anybody to know that I was doing this because I thought it was such a silly, stupid thing to do, especially when you don't know how to draw very well. And I didn't want anybody to ever ask for my sketchbook and me to have to show it to them <laughs> because I'd be embarrassed. So I'd be sneaky about it. I, I'd just sit in the corner seat in cafes with the walls behind me and I'd draw somebody really far away and I'd just get out of there as quickly as I could before anybody saw me. And the second reason I called it sneaky art, which kind of emerged later, it sort of organically grew out of the work itself was that because I was being sneaky and I was looking at people who were very far away from me, I noticed that what I was doing was that I was capturing what I also call sneaky art, which is just the endless things you see happening in the city. You see people talking to each other and they've got uh, coffee mugs in front of them or you see somebody standing next to a traffic light and they look really interesting with a really fancy building behind them or you're at a beach and you see people playing volleyball but there's also the endless sea behind them and all of those those little bits of actual art that exist in our world and if we look at it we can see it 
And because I was looking for it, because I was in this new part of the world that I didn't understand, which was the US, and I wanted to understand it. So I started to draw it and I started to capture also what I called sneaky art. This is something hidden in everyday life, hidden in ordinary events, in very normal places, but it's really beautiful if you start to learn to see it. And I filled sketchbooks and sketchbooks with it. I started to learn to draw better. I moved to a small town in Wisconsin with my wife. Uh, I lived there for three years and I just made a lot of drawings there too, in order to get to understand the Midwest, the rural Midwest, which was this completely alien world for me coming from India. I'd never seen anything like it. I didn't know, I didn't know how these, how, how the, how quickly the seasons changed and how things changed if the seasons changed. So where people hang out, what they do in cafes or bars, what, how much time they spend inside places and outside places, how they dress and that changes. So I was capturing all of that with my drawings and understanding more and more what, what urban sketching was about. It sort of became urban sketching for me, a way to understand and appreciate and explore my urban world. And well, I have some sketchbooks that I'd love to show you. Um, and I can show you the kind of drawings that I did and the kind of, the ways that I use my sketchbook with the tools that I use to, to, to capture what the, the life that I see. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, we'd love to see them. Yeah, uh, if you could switch the camera. Huh? I'm going to let you control the uh, with camera you, you spotlight. Yes, I'm going to um, I'm going to be in his phone. Wait a second. For some reason again. Oh yes, there. There is. Yeah. There you go. So, uh, for example, this is a sketchbook that I had from in 2019, from March to July. So before all hell broke loose. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, so I, I'd go to cafes and I would try to look at what people do here and the way they order their coffee, the things they order and uh, how, how they dress. The, this even the idea that people sit in cafes all day to do work that's it's a very american thing that doesn't happen anywhere else <laughs> and i i saw it for the first time in the u.s so i was fascinated that you just have people meeting each other in cafes there are job interviews in cafes there are conversations there are chess games in cafes and i wanted to capture all of this life and i wanted to capture it in a quick way I'm trying to be sneaky here. So I don't want people to see me. I can't expect to have lots of equipment around me that that will make me conspicuous. So I made my drawings with very simple tools. Uh, I still use the same stuff. Uh, I use a fountain pen. This is a Lamy Safari fountain pen that I really, really like. And I use it for pretty much all my drawings. And I have one more pen, which I use for these thick lines that I draw one or the other fine line or, or marker, but mostly it's one pen or two pens and one sketchbook. So if I'm going out, even if I'm going out for half an hour, if I'm going out for a walk, I'm able to carry one sketchbook and a couple of pens in my jacket pocket. And I'm ready to sketch even if I have 10 minutes, if I'm in a parking lot somewhere uh, waiting for my wife to pick up something and I have a half hour, I can sit and I can make a drawing. Uh, while I wait for my coffee, anywhere I wait for my coffee, I always make a drawing, even if it's five minutes, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, because it, there's always some, something that you, if you keep doing it, the more you do it, the more you learn to start to see things. And in very ordinary, basic things, like just two girls sitting, having coffee and talking to each other, they were working on some assignment, but through drawing it, I find I'm able to appreciate it more. I'm able to see more things in it. Those are fantastic. So these are all from this, uh, from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, where I stayed for a while. And then I always carry my sketchbook when I'm traveling. So uh, little bits of time at, in airports, like if I have 15 minutes before my flight, I'll make a drawing. When I'm on the plane and there's nothing I can do, I make drawings. Uh, uh, when I'm visiting relatives. 
And it's all kinds of things. So the other aspect of urban sketching that I really like is that what you draw is uh, the only way that I'm at least able to make a sustainable practice out of it is if I chase after the things that are interesting for me to draw and then draw those things. And because I'm working on half an hour or one hour of time, I don't have the luxury to draw a lot of things that I don't care for. So I just don't. Like I draw people who are incomplete. Uh, I don't give them feet and shoes very often. Um, nothing here either. Um, I don't. I don't know how to draw hands very well. So I always uh, have them do something. Uh, at least the people I draw are doing something. So I'm able to hide their hands in different ways. Um, I'm not very good at drawing trees. I get very irritated. Uh, it's a lot of work. It's, if you're doing line work, trees are really, really irritating to draw. So I find different ways to approximate them. Um, so I don't have to spend time doing that. Sometimes it's more interesting to draw the conversational dynamic between people, the way they look to me sitting next to each other. And it doesn't matter what their feet are doing or what kind of trousers they've got on. So I don't bother to draw the rest of their bodies. The drawing is just literally only the things that catch my interest in the little bit of time I have. And it helps me in different ways. As an artist, it teaches me to look for things that are interesting. It trains me to find things according to my taste. It teaches me to hone my taste and my instincts. And from simply doing so many of these drawings, each of these pages is probably 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, I was at the museum in Minneapolis when it opened and they had a huge exhibit of the moon and everybody was looking at it in the, in the darkness. And that just, just the sense of the sizes here was so interesting to me with the windows behind that that's the only thing I tried to capture. I didn't bother with the details of the moon itself or any of the architectural details. Just this little bit of shape that had come out I looked at that and I tried to draw that and then I put my people into it. I was just, my car was getting service. So I had an R at the dealership and I took that chance to draw as well. <laughs> um, this is about the time that I went to Chicago where I was an instructor at the Chicago seminar. So the couple of days before the seminar started, I was just walking around Chicago and drawing things. And uh, I love big cities. I'm from a big city myself. And what I really love about cities, and this is why urban sketching just works for me, is that I love to see how public art lives in a city. So this is a giant Picasso sculpture, which is in the middle of the business district in Chicago. And it's interesting to me how big it is, how much space it takes, and the way that people interact with it. There are some people who are looking at it, usually tourists. There are some people uh, using it as a landmark to call an Uber or something or the other. There are some people just having lunch in the middle of their day. And this is where they come and sit. And it's a beautiful sculpture, but it's also just a part of their life. And this is something that I like to observe. Just it's part of how I try to understand the city, how the questions that I personally try to answer. And usually uh, I find those answers through drawing them. So I love this city so much. I I'd walk around everywhere and I'd look at the architecture and I'd draw things, but always what interests me are, is what people are doing there. And I don't like to draw just buildings for the sake of drawing buildings. That, that's not my particular interest. Uh, my interest is the, the people that live there, the life that I see there. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that I try to capture better and better. And because I try to do it every day in little ways, I get slowly better at it as well. You know, Nishan, what's, what's fascinating to me is, is you said you couldn't draw and you said you drew stick people. So to attack drawing people as aggressively as you have, yeah. that to me, you're, you're overcoming your weakness, so to speak, in, in, your, in your drawing style. You know, the, the, the fear of, of drawing people and making look, but you've done such a marvelous job of capturing so many gestures and different types of people and sizes and so forth that is a very difficult uh task to overcome as an urban sketcher a yeah. lot of us don't like to even put people in our sketches because yeah. they're too tough to draw yeah so that, that's a good point you know uh, it's a very common refrain and i had that problem for the longest time i was 
really terrible at drawing. I was convinced, I was 27 years old and I was convinced I'm never going to be able to draw a person that looks like a person beyond a stick figure. <laughs> but uh, it took a lot of uh, understanding to be able to do it. And uh, of course it took a lot of practice, but what, see, uh, for example, this sketch, um, the things that I'm not good at, are, I'm not attacking them directly every time with every sketch. I'm trying to find solutions around them. In, I'm almost trying to avoid confronting them. So like I said about the trees, I just cannot bring myself to put the detailing for leaves and branches. So if you see what I did with these is I, I just took the outer pattern and I drew a few of the branches and then I gave up. And what it serves in my drawing, because I didn't pay attention here, I tried to pay attention on the mm -hmm. human activity. Mm -hmm. So what it does is if I spend less time on the thing that doesn't interest me and I spend more time on the thing that interests me, mm. it gives the thing that interests me more details. I give it more line work. In my case, it's line work. So I give it more details and I give the other thing less details. And then when you as a viewer look at my drawing, you also look at where the more details are. So I've discovered what it inadvertently does is by giving less attention to the things I care less about, I also have my viewer giving less attention to those things and instead looking at the things that I want them to look at. So a way to think of it is because I'm an engineer, I think of everything, I break it down in terms of information. A picture or a drawing or a painting of some kind is a certain amount of information that you give to people. You tell people about shapes, you tell people about uh, the number of things that are there, you put them in place so they're all in place. If you add color, then color is a whole set of information also. But what I try to do is I'm trying to say as much as I can while economizing on that information. How little, how little effort can I put in, in a sense? I'm lazy as an engine. All engineers are lazy. We try to do the most we can with the least amount of work. I'm going to so, quote you on that as well. Huh? How few lines can I make? to tell you that this is a bridge and this is where I stood and this is where the shadows were. And this is where the, you could see the result of the river going by. So there's moss and things like that. There's all kinds of uh, uh, mold over here. How do I convey that to you with the least amount of work? And this least amount of work idea is comes into me also seeps into me because I'm urban sketching. I'm outdoors mm -hmm. for various reasons. I'm not going to spend two or three hours over there the light will change, the people will come and go and I want to be inconspicuous. And I'll, I'll get bored for the most part also. So uh, because of those constraints, like uh, Lisa mentioned, don't bring too many tools when you go out to sketch and it might seem like a constraint, but it's not. And this is something I talk about in my podcast as well, that uh, it's not really a constraint constraints are often things that also set us free in if you look at it from another perspective so i have this fountain pen with me when i draw and this one pen that this is the these are the only tools i can work with and because these are the only tools i can work with i come up with lots of interesting ways to say things with them and that's a freedom that's come to me by not having too much choice in terms of the tools i want to use so this part of urban sketching I really appreciate is that having a limited set of tools, having a limited frame, having limited time, uh, attention to give to something, drawing something that might move people who might leave, it sets you free in a lot of ways. I don't have to draw everything realistically because I can't. There's no time for that. How, what is the only way that I'll finish it? I'll have to make a bunch of approximations I'll have to take a whole bunch of creative decisions, no details on the trees, for example, my creative decision. And what that does is it's your decision and it's your simplification and it's your choice of subject versus not subject. And this makes every drawing really my drawing and my point of view and my unique, my unique art all because of all of those constraints. So urban sketching does that for me. It helped me to develop a style. It helped me to, to learn how to draw people because I didn't have so much time. I couldn't have spent two hours drawing this person because they were almost finished with their coffee. They, they could have left in two minutes, five minutes or 10 minutes. I had no, I, no way of knowing. So faced with that kind of time commitment, time pressure, 
I drew quickly and I drew instinctively and I drew with what I had in my hands. And that's how I learned how to draw people. These are all 15, 20 second sketches because all of these people were, were walking by me. You know, the style, uh, Nishant, is so confident. You know, when you, when you go directly to ink, and I've, I've had a number of, of people ask me, oh, wait a minute, I can't, I'd, I'd rather lay out in pencil and then mm -hmm. come back with the ink to make sure that, you know, but when you go right to the ink pen and you say some of them are, are just seconds that you're drawing, yeah. you know, that's what's so fascinating about the urban sketcher world. It's, it's building that confidence in all of us to be able to just put the pen to paper and, and, and start the line yeah. and see where it ends up. It's, yeah, that's not to hang in the Louvre, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, but it's going to be quite an expressive opportunity. That's, well, that's great. Yeah, that's very true. And, you know, that I, it's, it's a position I put myself in. I decided that I was going to draw in ink before I learned how to draw very well. And the idea was that I used to keep erasing things. I was always trying to be perfect with my sketches and I'd never finish them. So that frustrated me. And I wanted to just turn the page. So I told myself, I'm going to draw with ink. And if I make a mistake, I can't do anything now. I'm going to have to keep drawing and I'm going to have to draw the next page. That's it. There are no steps backwards. And that's a philosophy I inculcated that urban sketching means there are no steps backwards. If I make a mistake and I do make mistakes in my drawings quite often, I'm just much better at hiding them now. And I'm better at <laughs> minimizing my mistakes or uh, when you work with ink, you kind of plan your page in a certain way that you won't make the glaring mistakes. You develop these different kinds of strategies. And it's interesting to do that because all of those things bring out my style because mm -hmm. they are my responses to the different constraints and difficulties that I'm feeling. So these people are drawn this way with this minimal lines and these few things to suggest so much because I didn't have the time to do more. And if I had the time to do more, maybe I wouldn't have done so much. And these lines are confident because there's no other alternative. There's no other way that I can make this line. I only get one chance to do it. So if I make a bad drawing, I make another drawing. And I, I like that idea a lot. Uh, so especially for people who work on other kinds of art as well, it's not something that you can think about when you're working on a big canvas frame. You can't afford to make, just go into it and not take care of your mistakes. So, but sometimes you learn from having that kind of carefree attitude. And that means if you can't afford to make mistakes, you can't afford to practice, you can't afford to experiment things. So I would suggest to people who make a lot of traditional art that urban sketching is your opportunity to practice. It's a lab now. It's a laboratory in which you can experiment with media, you can experiment with styles, you can have a low cost attempt to try something. What is 10 minutes to you? This was before my drink order arrived. What does it matter? What's, what's the value of it? What does it matter if I make a bad sketch? It's just 10 minutes before my drink order arrived. It's something I did instead of looking at my phone. So even if I make a bad sketch, and this is an incomplete sketch, it's not a waste of my time. It's something I picked up that day. Maybe I learned how to draw someone's uh, cap backwards. Maybe I learned hey, if I don't draw the rest of their leg, it actually doesn't matter. It kind of, it kind of, it's kind of okay. Like I can leave the drawing like this mm -hmm. and someone might think it's a complete drawing. So uh, I urge people to experiment on their pages and having sketchbooks is a very good way to mentally ready yourself to make experiments, to try things because it's just four by six inches of one sketchbook page. You know, what fascinates me about your style, Nishan, is that the lines are so confident. I mean, mm -hmm. you put the pen down and when you draw a shape, it's there. There's no redo in the line. Yeah. There's no scribble, scratchy, sketchy kind of lines. Mm -hmm. They're just a very confident shape. You're sim you, you've got a simple approach and it's so impactful visually. It, it's really, it's really a cool, really a, a, a you know, cool process. You have, you have yeah. a style that's, it's, that's it's, so you. It's a, it's a lot of fun to do it this way. And I'm glad that I worked to make this style happen for me. And, 
and it's it's just it's i love to express it this way it's finally in for the first time in my life i have a style that i like and i have my own style which i really for the longest time thought i wasn't going to develop it was a little late let me do a little demo for you maybe i can show you how i draw people for example excellent yeah so um i'm drawing this portrait um i can't show you the portrait unfortunately but there are four people here in front of the mountains in i think this is somewhere in utah and i'm going to draw the the family and the idea when i draw with ink is like you mentioned there's no going back mm -hmm. i can only go forward every line is the line so before i start uh i have to know where i'm going to go i have to have a rough idea of how i'm going to go over my page and i'm i have to think about uh so i have to develop these strategies about where do i start drawing a person so that i know where the next line needs to go so that i know where the next structure needs to go everything i draw on the page because i don't have the pencil underlining underneath it everything i draw on the page is my anchor or my reference for the next thing that i draw on the page so the way that i go through my page is by building these supports and anchors and reference points which help me correct the next object that i need to draw mm. and that's a nice attitude it's a nice uh, mental strategy to inculcate every artist can use it i feel so four people here in front of me on a on drawing and let me show you how i would draw is this uh, is this close enough do i should i bring the screen a uh, screen a little closer uh, maybe that says excellent that's excellent nishan that, that's really good right yeah. where you got it yeah there you go great all right so something like this i love starting at the ears because the ears immediately give me a lot of information i know uh, where i can very quickly dictate where the head is turned towards i have a sense of posture i have a sense of where the other features like the nose and the eyes etc need to go so i've learned how to find these things and how to start at these things and you'll notice that i make a lot of long lines like i don't make short strokes and that's very intentional as well it's the way that i find i'm best able to make what i call my lines they're not precise they're not always absolutely correct but they're absolutely my lines the way that i would draw them and that's what people see and it gives you a sense that they are the right lines because even though they're not like my perspective can be a little off i get some details wrong i get some spacing issues sometimes but everything here is consistent with my style so it looks like it belongs <laughs> i pick up from here where the other person needs to be with by drawing the the collar i have a sense for where their head is uh, the size of their torso i get a lot of information down so i can come back to this later if i want it let's let's try that and see what that does so i could draw another thing that uh, is a really useful lesson and i teach this in my workshops also is as an urban sketcher you're distilling reality what you see in front of you you don't have a photograph to work out of so you have to learn to find what is the important thing that you want to draw and you have to learn to not be intimidated by the things that are difficult so for example if people are difficult for you what's difficult for you is a face what's difficult for you is a nose what's difficult for you is arms and shoulders and elbows and if you break it down into those things all of those things individually are difficult but what if you didn't draw it like that what if you looked at a human body just as the lines that appeared in front of you without connecting it to your mental recognition of what is a face or what is an ear what is an eye instead of that you just drew the lines as you saw them it's a way to uh, bypass the the fear and you learn to trust your lines and you learn to bring out your organic lines for whatever you're drawing so someone's fit as someone's body another person's jacket another person's head but i can always go back and fill these in because i try as much as i can to just see the shapes and not be intimidated by oh this neck needs to be exactly correct and in case it looks like i'm not making any mistakes i've made 
hundreds and hundreds of mistakes. I've been drawing every day since I left my I left my career to be an artist, and I've maybe I've run out of a lot of my mistakes now, but I've made them all. <laughs> I sometimes draw things in a very strange order, not in an order that you would go about drawing them, simply to to break out of my 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 basic patterns, like the the default ways that I draw lines. Just to break out of that rut, I'll draw it in a different style. Like I, sometimes I draw people even from observation, but I draw them from the feet up instead of from the head down, and that's hmm. it's just an exercise to to challenge myself to see things in a more fresh way. I don't put a lot of details in a lot of ways. The drawing will look incomplete, but that is my personal filter of what is enough information, what is uh, important to share, and what I think is irrelevant. Again, that becomes my vision of the drawing, and it makes it, uh, with my urban sketches, with these kind of portrait drawings, it makes it very distinctly my work because it carries all of my decisions of what matters and what doesn't. And usually um, this is because a lot of my art is inspired from the kind of comic books I used to read. I give it this illustration kind of thicker border. And I like to do it because I am a big fan of comic books and I think they have a lot to teach anybody who's interested in, in capturing the attention of viewers, especially in a time when the times we live in, in which you don't get a lot of time from them. They don't uh, have a lot of attention to give you. They're easily distracted. In that time, it's good to learn from an industry that basically thrives on the concept that people are not going to give you a lot of time. And that's comic books. Hmm. So uh, by controlling how much information, this is my finished drawing, for example. So. There's a lot of uh, decisions I've taken about, because I'm drawing from a photo, so decisions about what I want to show, what I don't, what I've simplified, what I haven't drawn at all, but it distills a lot of the real photos information into this format, and it becomes easy to digest. Anybody who looks at it immediately has a takeaway feeling from it. I give them a certain amount of details, whatever I deem as enough details, and this, is, this makes it my drawing. That's a fun little sketch. Holy smokes. That's a fun little sketch. <laughs> so uh, I do a lot of urban sketching even while traveling. This is one of the first uh, travel sketchbooks that I made. Um, I've started doing this thing before. I mean, I had to stop because of the pandemic, of course. But before the pandemic, maybe my last seven or eight vacations were all uh, sketchbook. I didn't take any photographs. I just made sketchbooks of them. And uh, Lisa showed one of these sketchbooks. It's an accordion style sketchbook. So it comes out like this. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just love it. It's a great way to think of my entire trip as one, as one product. It's one sketchbook, which is one long scroll for one long trip. And this is when I visited uh, India for a, uh, for a friend's wedding. And then I went to the Netherlands to see my old university and meet some friends there. So I'm at the airport. I have a half hour. This is back in 2017. I was still doing watercolors then. And I was, think I was thinking about subjects. And the subject here for me was the fact that when you're at an airport, you see so many different people from different parts of the world. And the only thing you have in common with them is that they're getting on the same plane as you. <laughs> and that was so interesting to me that we, were, we had come together and we don't know each other. We have nothing to do with each other. 
but we're all here to make this flight take off and we will all go on it and we will get wherever we want to go. So slack time is a great time to sketch, a great time to find a challenge, to think about how I'm going to represent details, for example, to use my time in a productive way and make a drawing. I landed in Mumbai, in Bombay, in India, and uh, I'd never been in the city before. So I walked around, I looked for interesting things. There's a lot of colonial architecture there. And I made a drawing sitting by the side of the street somewhere. And this became then the, I, I, I tried to fix a simple rule. Like I would make at least one drawing for every day of my travel. And it would have to say something about where I was, what was happening and why that scene was important. It gave me something to do at these different places I went. I made notes about what I was doing. And simply because of these circumstances that I don't have a lot of time, I have to work in limited time. Mm -hmm. It meant that I would draw economically and I would use colors sparingly and I would try different ways to express despite having spared, you know, sparing colors and a few lines and little time. And that is a nice exercise to put yourself through. How can I say things with less time, with less lines, with less colors? You can see here, when I do colors, I do pencil lines. Uh, so with watercolors, I, I can't, you can hardly see the lines here, but this one has pencil lines on it. So back when I was doing watercolors, I would make a very faint, quick pencil line. No erasers because I don't have the patience for that, but <laughs> just some quick pencil lines to tell me where the colors need to go. And then because when you're working with colors, you want to put the colors down and then put the ink down after that usually so that uh, the ink can be much darker against the color. Um, I, I love to look at people and I love to see the things they do. So I'm always trying to, I'm looking at interesting things they do. And I, I, I look at the juxtaposition of images like this or somebody staring into the sea in the morning, smoking a cigarette and they have a, they have a cocktail with them. So these kind of things, images that make me think or images that just strike me as curious. I draw them and then after having drawn them, I realize what I liked about them. So that's another aspect of urban sketching that's very consistent with people who listen to my podcast, uh, people who are guests on my podcasts as well. That Sometimes you find out what you like about something only after you have given it that mm. time, which a drawing takes. Mm. Uh, we take a lot of photos. It's super easy to take pictures, but even if you're a really great photographer, you're not spending the amount of, just the amount of time that you're spending with something when you draw it. And spending that time, giving something that time is, is an homage in a way. You are giving it a lot of respect as well. And you are learning to see more and more things. The act of drawing then becomes a way to kind of break down that abstract thought, that abstract thought that, hey, this looks interesting. Let's draw it but I don't know what exactly is interesting, but having drawn it, having put down the colors, having put down these different things in different sizes, I understand better what is interesting. Mm. And I understand better to get to the root of not just the objective statement, what is interesting, but the more subjective, the more elusive thing of what is interesting to me and why, what is it that I like? And that's an important question to answer as an artist. You have to figure out what you are, who, who, what, do you, what do you like to do and why? So I went to the Escher Museum in Den Haag in the Netherlands. And as soon as I came out, I was just, my mind was whirling with the thoughts of his work. And I drew something like one of his optical illusions, which is something, a very popular print of his in which he has uh, his desk and then the city outside it. And it's... Uh, joined together into one image. So I was thinking like Escher <laughs> that day. <laughs> so this became one travel sketchbook, one long page to show my journey and the things I saw. And I remember all of them more than if I'm more yes. than from my pictures. Like I remember all of these moments very distinctly, how I felt, what I saw, all the things I didn't put on the page, I can still remember them in my mind. And that's something that you get only from, from travel sketching, I think. That's so much better than looking through a photo album. 
you know? Yeah, yeah. So one thing we ask people, I ask people on my podcast is um, about photographs versus sketches. And, you know, everybody's seen everything. <laughs> now everyone has literally seen everything. You can't surprise anyone with any picture. You can't really shock them. So what do people care to see? People still look at drawings though. And the reasons are interesting too. It's because a drawing is very subjective. A drawing is not literally everything that was there. A drawing is what sense did you make of what you saw? What did you make? What did you see? So there's a lot of interest in, in that. And that's a very cool thing. It, it kind of gives artists an opportunity to really be something now. Because people are not so, it's not so, people are kind of jaded by by all the kind of media that we see everywhere. If I make a drawing of something, I find people are more eager to see it than if I showed them a photograph of mm -hmm. it. And that kind of uh, attitude that a viewer has towards a drawing and even a simple drawing. So this, this is one I really like. Uh, for somebody who doesn't know how to draw people very well, it's a really lovely thing to draw people really far away because you don't have to give them all those details. You just have to draw a few lines to say many things. This is someone sitting facing the water, someone looking to their right, children playing on the rocks. And it's it simply because I'm drawing them so far away, it reduces my challenge. I don't have to draw their faces because I can't possibly draw their faces. I just have to draw something that looks like a face. And if I can do that, I can show you a person. Feel free to ask me questions, by the way. I can, I can, uh, uh, instead of me going on about what I see. I love that yeah, I you leave, sorry. No, go ahead. I love that you leave notes on uh, certain pieces. Mm -hmm. What, what do you consider? Is that just like what seems most important to you at the moment? Or is there any thought put into it? Well, uh, when I'm traveling, so something like this, when I'm traveling, I do try to uh, make a note of how I feel at that moment. Uh, I'm trying to incorporate more writing in my work. Uh, as a fan of comics, I'm always interested in comic panels and word balloons and things like that. It's, uh, it's just another way to give information to the person, to give context to what I drew. So although most of the time I just have a location marker and a date marker, I sometimes uh allow myself to to write some words but i always think about so how do i decide whether i don't want to write something is when i think about the broader composition so this was in the rain in new orleans uh there was a line outside cafe du monde and my friends and my wife were in line while i made a drawing it suddenly started to rain a guy was selling very very timely a guy appeared to sell ponchos <laughs> and I was jostled by the crowds on the other side of the street while I made this drawing and I, I put in a lot of people. Um, I thought about whether I wanted to put words here, but then I zoomed out of what I drew and I looked at the shape that I had on the page and I decided I don't really want to fit anything more in it. And it's, it's nice like this, just this little bit over here. And also afterwards, I went to Cafe Du Monde and I was profoundly disappointed because I didn't know they have only one item on the menu. <laughs> but it's a darn good uh, item, I will say. It's really great, <laughs> but I was in the mood for breakfast that day and I had uh, no idea what I was doing. And it was, uh, I had to have another breakfast after that. So, but I got a great drawing out of it, so I don't mind. Uh, at night, uh, we went in New Orleans, we went down uh, the French Portal and we went to this beautiful jazz cafe and I made this drawing of the musicians while they were playing. I made this with a brush pen. So this is not a fountain pen, but it had to be really quick because they were in the middle of the solo and I wanted to finish it before they, they changed or they, you know, some of the uh, musicians went somewhere else or it became a different performance. So this was like maybe a 15, 20 minute drawing uh, after we'd just come in from the rain and just got enough of spears. Nisha, talk, talk a little bit about your confidence level now, you know, you started out saying that you would go hide yourself in a corner and you'd sort of crouch over your paper. You didn't want to show uh -huh. anybody anything. So tell it can, because, you know, New Orleans, uh, you know, I'm from there. So mm -hmm. obviously, you know, if you're drawing or painting, especially in a crowded location, people are always drawn to the drawer, 
<laughs> drawn to the the artist to the sketcher how are you handling that these days well uh, i really prefer to not be seen like i i really like being inconspicuous i don't uh there's a bit of there's a bit of that attitude already like there's always a bit of imposters complex imposter syndrome um i don't really want to be seen i've never thought of myself as an artist quote unquote so mm -hmm. it's difficult to introduce myself as an artist i hate having to tell people things about myself which is why i had to ask you to do it for me <laughs> <laughs> so i don't want to have to do it in public and i like being sneaky so the second reason that i told you about the emergent reason for making sneaky art is something that's true even now and that's my compelling reason to be inconspicuous when i draw it's that uh, imagine if you're seeing the eiffel tower for example there's the spot that everybody takes a picture from it's the most obvious view of the eiffel tower that everyone's now seen on google images most number of tourists are also over there and if you were there to take a picture it's quite likely you'd take a picture from that same spot but when i'm going there as an artist and i'm trying to be out of the way what it does and this is something i discuss on the podcast with some other travel sketchers also is that i'm compelled to not take my first choice of point of view i have to look for a second and maybe that's also occupied so i have to look for a third or a fourth and what that does is i don't just go with the first thing that occurred to me i can't afford to sit down in the middle of the street i can't be in front of the person that i want to draw i have to find a creative solution and this practice this exercise of trying to be out of the way but trying to have a good view or trying to be out of the way and therefore being able to see only certain things and having to find a, a subject out of that so this being my view of the airport terminal i learn to examine my surroundings with more care and i have to dive a little deeper to understand what i like about it or what is worthy of art in it what can i still draw because this is the only place i'm able to sit and this is the only direction i'm able to look what can i find here that's worth it and that exercise is a great exercise in, as an artist because not having that liberty again a constraint but it really sets you free because it asks you to go deeper and you go deeper you ask yourself more questions you try to do things you've never done before and being a little bit out of my comfort zone in that sense that's where all the good stuff is all the good stuff is outside my comfort zone so it's interesting to me is that you're trying I mean, to remain this on a bus yeah it was interesting is is you're trying to be inconspicuous and on your your instagram site has 10,000 followers <laughs> you have a tremendous podcast you know you're not doing a very good job of remaining inconspicuous it's it's antithetical like the whole idea is crazy it won't work so i'm going to have to do something maybe disappear it's it maybe it's a good thing that i left i left oh claire at a time when i was getting super recognizable so maybe that was uh, it had to be this way it worked out for me that way but um I, it's it's interesting like i think i've been spotted a few times now so people know who i am yes. and they've approached me but uh, so in one sense it's not sneaky but in the in another sense it is because the persons that i'm drawing and the things that i'm interested in drawing so this is another aspect maybe there's a third reason why it's important to be sneaky in art and this is this was the title of one of my workshops the subtitle of my workshop the importance of sneakiness in the pursuit of art <laughs> is that you want to be a fly on the wall you don't want to affect the world you're in you want to be like uh, richard attenborough you want to just be outside it you want to be looking at it but you don't want to touch it because it's beautiful it's a lot of art you just want to take it down you don't want to spoil it or touch it or affect it in any way this is a 600 year old mosque in a tomb in uh, the center of new delhi in india it's really really gorgeous beautiful it it has a fascinating history and i drew this while i was waiting for a friend again i didn't draw the tree i used it instead as mm -hmm. white space because i don't like to draw trees <laughs> <laughs> and i think there are a lot of uh, like this entry way here there are a lot of them like more than 20 on each side and it's a it's a it's a square shape so on all sides and i didn't draw them because they all look the same and i get tired of drawing things when they look the same 
So I don't want to do it. So I didn't do it. And that makes it again an interesting kind of point of view. Um, I was also in a shrine, in a Sufi Muslim shrine in old Delhi. And this, this place is like a thousand years old and people, pilgrims come here. And I sat among them to just see the kind of people who've come. This is a tomb which is 600 years old also in Delhi that I was looking at. And then I made these little observations of the people who were there picnicking. And I purposely try to make these really small because then it's a challenge. How, what, what can I say while they're really small? And what are the things I don't need to say anymore? So uh, we were talking about drawing people and how that can be intimidating. Uh, in my workshops, I teach how to draw people. And one of the ways I do it is we go backwards. We think of what is the least, starting from stick figures, what is the least amount of uh, details that you need to do in order to convey a person? And what is it that you're able to convey and what not? So if you draw stick figures, you're able to show pose, you're able to show if you maybe if you draw hair also, you're, you can show gender more easily. You can show action, you can show posture, you can show whether they're walking or sitting or running, uh, a lot of dynamic stuff, but you can't make them resemble any specific person. So next step is you can add clothes or you can add uh, torso, torsos and uh, trousers, and that tells you which part of the world they might be. And another level of detail is to give their facial features detail. And then you know what kind of who, who the person is. And you don't have to always do that. So this is a friend of mine who's a stand-up comic in New Delhi. <laughs> and I wanted it to be obvious who he is. So I gave him details. But I want you to know there are people listening. But I don't really care to tell you exactly who they look like or exactly who they are because that's unnecessary information. So you see me to make very uh, specific decisions about what to show and what not. I haven't given eyes to some of them because... It, it, it doesn't really matter. I haven't given feet uh, to a lot of them because again, I don't really uh, want you to look over there. I want you to look over here. So these kind of decisions are fun to make. Uh, I learn a lot from making them. I find people notice things and then no, don't notice others. And it tells me about, about people, how, how they like art and what they, what they like to look at. So a lot of airport drawings always. <laughs> Your style has become so distinctive. Yeah, so this is 2018. I was still sort of uh, cutting down the lines. So uh, they, uh, they say this about sculpture, for example, that sculpture is not that you're making something out of marble, you're kind of removing the excess marble to get to the sculpture. That's a way of thinking about it. And that's a way that I think about my artistic journey also that over time, I've learned how to say it with less lines and find mm. the least number of lines to get my point across. And that's that's kind of what I see when I go from my... So we did 2017. This was 2018. Uh, let's look at my latest sketchbook. Um, this is the one I'm using right now. Uh, I also change up the formats of my sketchbook. So landscape, uh, portrait, square, long, tall... I keep changing that up because I like to think of my sketchbook uh, frame as uh, my sketchbook page as my frame. So this one is a long sketchbook and I use it as a long frame. Mm -hmm. It means that I have to look at things in perspective, but uh, I can I don't really go deep in layers. It, it, it comes up with all these kinds of, like the things that I choose to draw. If I was drawing in the landscape, in the portrait format, which I've also done exactly at this same spot, uh, I would draw it differently. So I drew this same kind of scene when I was at the sea wall. Let's see how that was. Yeah. So I drew at the sea wall, but then I was drawing in this format. I was looking at different things to make my subject. I was looking at the boats more closely. I was able to give them more detail. But when I was drawing long, uh, in a long format, suddenly I zoomed out of these details. I was looking more at the broader shapes of objects and trying to fit different things in them. So there's a lot to learn from doing that. There's a lot to learn from uh, challenging yourself to look at things 
in different shapes, in different boxes, fit them in different places. So what becomes your subject? What's in the middle? What's on the sides? How important is what's on the sides? Questions like that, you can answer from changing up your sketchbooks, trying something new every day, pushing yourself to try a format that you're not typically good at. So uh, something like this, very little urban scenery, but lots of people. So just the essential things at a beach. There are a lot of benches. There's, there's a lamppost to suggest where we are. I didn't draw the water. I didn't draw the sand. I don't really draw the roads very much. But I tell you what, I, I think about then what I want to say. And that's all that I tell you. Because I had one hour, it was really cold. My hands were frozen by the end of it. And I had to get out. So this is the point where I bailed. I decided I cannot say anything more because <laughs> my hands are going to fall off. So I left. <laughs> but I'm enjoying this long format these days. It, uh, I have to put some perspective in my work, which is challenging when you're working straight with ink. But it, it allows me to do these sweeping vistas. And I like that challenge. Still, I draw zoomed in as well. So I drew somebody on the bus the other day. And that was fun. I always, on sunny days, I go to where people are and I draw them doing their thing. So this is a bunch of people taking in the sun in Vancouver, having lunch at the Granville Island Market. And this is the view looking down from my, my, my apartment. The process of making lunch one day. <laughs> and so this is like this is like a nice urban sketch for me because it tells me about the city it uh, puts it in a very specific place so I have information about where I am and it's still centered on the people and mm. uh, you'd mentioned that you know people are pe uh, artists often put people right at the end after drawing everything else and uh, only if they can still spare the space because they're afraid of ruining the sketch or making a mistake. And I think it's just a crime to not draw people in urban scenes because any urban scene, any urban environment without people is a dystopia. That's, that's post-apocalypse. The <laughs> only reason a city exists at all is because people live there. The only reason a building is a cafe is if somebody's inside there having coffee. Otherwise, it's not a cafe. It's a street if people are walking on it. It's a lamppost if there's somebody standing next to it. It's a building if somebody's trying to get into it. Otherwise, they're just things. They don't, they don't have any reason to be. So human activity is central to city life. The only reason you have beautiful places in cities is so that people can enjoy them. And uh, comfort or conversation or meeting or just uh, sitting, standing at the edge, contemplating life. So it's the other way around. When you go out to draw and you look at the city, draw the people first and then draw everything in relation to them. So the reason I drew this scene is not because this perspective was interesting and it really was, but it's because I wanted to draw these guys over here and what they were doing. And that's what made this perspective interesting. So kind of flipping, flipping it on its head, thinking about uh, the landscape with respect to the human activity in it. And that's really important to me in the style that I draw. So in this scene, I have people at in the foreground, in the middle ground, in the background. And if you notice, they're all at very different levels of detail. And that's intentional too. Uh, it helps to set them one behind the other, one less important than the other. Another thing I look for when I, uh, this is a, a great example of how to avoid drawing trees, by the way. Uh, I drew the branch, I drew the, the trunk, but I didn't want to draw a lot of the branches of the other trees and I didn't give a lot of details to the, to the, to the leaves at all, but it became negative space inside which my people were contained. And <laughs> this is something I also try to do is I look for natural frames in my, in my landscape. How are people enclosed inside their city? So these, these three people were enclosed between this lamppost and this tree trunk. 
and this is my composition space and this is my background far in the distance and this is almost another frame this uh, this tree and this lamppost with the science world and a person on a on a kayak so this is another frame that was formed naturally and this was another frame that was formed naturally that i wanted to show it's a great way to simplify a very complex scene Just do it incrementally do it do it like you know sections of the page yeah yeah and i am having to do it because i don't have that uh, luxury of time and i don't have the luxury to erase anything so I have to strategize. I have to uh, draw things in a certain. So let's look at, for for example, this one. I started with them because I didn't know when they would leave, and I liked their the the posture with which they were standing. So I drew them, and this gave me a horizon line to work with. And then I went. I think yeah, I drew these lines which come out of. So once I have the horizon line, I can see my vanishing point somewhere here. So. I then drew these lines out from there. I put this person in and then I went backwards. And then I pulled, I pulled this part out and I drew this very quickly. And then I wait, while I was drawing these things, I waited for more different kinds of people to sit here and I would put them into place. So what I do here is I'm going backwards and I'm making less and less details. So these buildings, these skyscrapers in the back, I really don't have any patience for skyscrapers, even though I love to draw cities. <laughs> I'm not going to draw hundreds of windows in perfect perspective. That's too much work for me. I don't care. So I do these things with them. Like I just tell you there are skyscrapers at the back and that's all you need to know. <laughs> Let's come back to the front. So I have more details here so that that's where you look. Again, uh, no, no feet sometimes. What's interesting, we, we talked a little bit last night, Nishant, you know, uh, some of us know Jim Richards uh, down in Sarasota, and when he attacks a, an urban scene, a complex urban scene, mm -hmm. the first thing he does, he draws a, a, a horizon line, and right. he starts drawing the people. And all the people at different sizes, but all their eye levels are right on that horizon line. So you have that instantaneous feeling of perspective and also action within the environment. The environment exactly. comes last. It's yeah. the people first, which is Absolutely. really fascinating. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's, uh, that's a, so there's, there's a very good reason to do it. And then there's a very good incentive to do it. The very good reason to do it is that if you draw that line first, like sort of like what I was saying with why I, what I do when I draw with ink is that you have to draw first the thing that helps you to draw all the things after it so that you don't make those mistakes. Everything is consistent with respect to everything else. Mm -hmm. So having a horizon line first for him in the kind of scenes that he draws helps him to set everything else in place, helps him to know where the, where the people's heads need to be, where everything vanishes into. And that solves a lot of questions for him right after one line. And how that one line comes out when he draws it on the blank sheet of paper kind of determines where the rest of the sketch is going to go and helps him to, to balance everything with everything else. The other thing which is really great is if you're an urban sketcher and you draw people, you're never good. Like, so if I, when I drew all of these guys were not all there at the same time. Because while I was drawing this guy, maybe somebody else walked off and they were replaced by someone else. So what you do when you're drawing people in an urban, people are the only dynamic things in your urban environment, unless you also draw cars, for example. So treating them the same way, while over the course of the one hour that I spent drawing this scene, I saw these people in different uh, points of time. Hmm. And when I saw them, Dependent, dependent on which part of the page I was on at that time. So I started drawing from here. I went this way. I'm drawing in ink and I can't afford to smudge. So I go left to right. That's one constraint uh, solving one problem for me. I will always have to go top left to bottom right. That's just, uh, it's, it's fixed for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going in this direction. And when I need to draw something here or when I draw this lamppost and I think about whether I want to draw something here and I look up and I see these guys and that's when they come into my drawing. By the time I drew these guys, maybe these guys have left. Then when I reach this part of the page and I'm maybe following someone else and I draw them, that's when this guy was walking by with the surfboard. So that's when he got drawn and he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't there while I was drawing these guys, for example. Mm 
So urban sketching becomes what uh, Don Colley says in my podcast. Uh, it's it's not the instantaneous look. It's the sustained look. So the scene that I draw is one hour of what I saw in the best composition that I could give it. And that is really liberating. There's a lot of artistic expression possible here. There's a lot of potential for you to exercise various creative decisions and to see how they would pan out. So drawing these guys left to right, a lot of them changed while I was drawing. And that it, it became part of my drawing in a very interesting way. It means that this moment, that I, it's not a moment that I captured. It is from reality, but in a sense, it never really happened exactly like this. And that's very cool to me. That's very cool. That's very cool. I want to I want to open it up to other questions as well, uh, mm -hmm. Nishan, and I also want to be sensitive to time. I, I know we've we're in here here on the East Coast. It's uh, it's it's nine twenty six. Uh, I know it's a little uh, earlier where mm -hmm. you are, but I wanted to give everyone a, an opportunity to to ask a question as well because I, I find. Uh, this philosophy and this approach fascinating. Uh, many of us just get bogged down in such a level of detail mm -hmm. and, and we overwork and it looks like a bunch of mud, but the, the beauty of simplification is just that. It's just such a statement when you can simplify. And sometimes simplification is a greater statement than the complex, scene you know than 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 the overworking of complexities so it's a yeah i i absolutely agree uh it's it's very difficult to be simple to to minim to yep. be minimalistic yes it involves a lot of your decision and your trusting your decision you have to trust your instinct you have to go with confidence you don't have time and you have to do this and it has to be quick and it has to look good so you don't have time for second thoughts you don't have the luxury to hesitate. And I love that aspect of urban sketching. Even if I'm going to make a mistake, uh, this is just what I was in that moment. In that moment, I was tired. So in that moment, this is how I drew people. And that's also part of my sketch. It's part of the identity of that moment. It makes that work. It makes my imperfect sketches more valuable to me than my perfect sketches because the imperfect ones now carry the information, the imprint of who I am. I was irritated, I was impatient, I was tired under the sun. So this is what I did at that day, on that location, at that time. So all of that becomes part of my sketch. And so we should really embrace our imperfections. Imperfections are really what make it our work and not a machine. I love it. I love how you, um, you draw what appeals to you mm -hmm. and and through that, you create a scene that, I don't know, speaks to you more and records more to you. I never think of it like that enough. There's a lot of things that appeal to me that aren't necessarily urban sketching. So I try to steer away from them, but, but I'm heartbroken because they're things that really appeal to me. So yeah. what I'm listening to you and I'm, I'm taking from that is that Oh, the heck with everybody else, whether they think it's urban sketching. To me, it's urban sketching. It's what appeals to me. So Absolutely. I feel better about it already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for example, something like this is not technically urban sketching because I'm not really telling you much about the location. These are just lots of people. Uh, they're not composed in a specific way. So it doesn't come under the umbrella of urban sketch, although it's drawn from observation. It's people in urban locations but there's no suggestion of the urban environment, so it doesn't qualify. But yeah, like it, the reason why I'm able to think this way, again, is because I'm drawing in a sketchbook. It's just a sketchbook page. It's just five and a half by seven and a half inches. It's just 15 minutes. What is 15 minutes worth? Is 15 minutes not worth me trying something crazy? What, what, what's the point of being an artist? Right. So that kind of freedom comes because of, again, because of these constraints, there's no time. It's just a little sketchbook. All I have is a pen. But yeah, there's little time, so I have to, I can only do one thing. There's only a sketchbook, so it doesn't really matter what I do. There's only one pen, so there's no there's no way to waste time thinking about the perfect tool. You can just do it. Love it, love it. 
I am finding this so encouraging because sometimes I draw with just the simple lines and I think that it's too simple, that it's not good enough. It's not like some of these beautiful urban sketches that I see and they have different shading and all this stuff. And to see your work just encourages me so much because that's easier for me to do than the other. And of course, the way you put the people in and have explained everything has just been wonderful. Yeah, I'm happy to hear that, Phyllis. You should absolutely feel free to draw only the things you like to draw and only in the way that you want to draw them, the way you want to depict them. Because really, that's the only thing you have to offer that is just you. If you made the perfect drawing, it's exactly the way you could have a computer programmed to make, you know, one of those Instagram filters which make things look like paintings. That's what it would be if you made everything uh, anatomically correct or you made everything proportional and co perfectly composed as what you see. That's, it's boring. Nobody, nobody really cares for that. Anybody can see it anywhere. The only thing you have to offer that really matters is what you think is good and the way you think you want to draw it. So like absolutely just go for it and pick up stuff from what you see, chase after what is interesting to you. It's the, the, the collateral effect of this will be that even if you imagine that it doesn't make you a great artist, what it does, and this is a goal of my podcast, I try to tell people, is that it will make you a better observer of your world. You will become more appreciative of the surroundings you live in, you will notice your neighborhood, you will notice the little things in parks, you will notice the way light uh, filters through the trees and falls on the ground and these little strange silly things that you see around you you start to see them more and that's a huge gift that it will give you and it has nothing to do with being an artist or being really good at art or knowing how to do the shades you first have to see and if you can start to see you will instantly be so much happier thank you wow those are words to live by Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, uh, so it's, it's been important for me to do this and to think of it this way because uh, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to appreciate a foreign world that I was in, that I felt an outsider in, being one of the very, very few brown people in rural Wisconsin. There was nobody around for hundreds of miles who was like me or from my part of the world. So this, uh, trying to find similarities, trying to find what they do that I also like that I also think is beautiful or interesting. It helps you to bond with, and even in times of a pandemic, you know, it helps you to bond with strangers. I drew somebody who was sitting in the park the other day and he was sitting 50 meters away from me, 50 feet, 100 feet away from me. And there's no way they knew that I was drawing them. They were talking to each other and I don't know who they are. They don't know who I am, but I was with them in a way. I made a drawing of them. I looked at their head. I looked at the way they were tilted towards each other. I looked at what they were wearing. I appreciated what, how they were sitting with each other and talking to each other on that bench from the point of view that I had, that only I could see because I was sitting there. And so it, I connected in a way, even though I don't get to talk to them or don't have to talk to them. The connection to an artist subject is, is the key as well, regardless of whether it's a building, a landscape or people to connect, you connect through observation and feeling and, you know, atmosphere and everything else. And it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to, to hear. Yeah. That too, so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a good yeah. point. You know, what was interesting, we, we were talking last night, uh, Anna and Lisa and I, uh, to, to Nishan and, and, you know, with the zoo uh, sketch crawl coming up, and Nishant said immediately, he said, the last thing I would paint or, or the last thing I would draw at the zoo would be animals. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I, I'm so bad at drawing animals, so <laughs> I wouldn't care to do it. And it wouldn't, it's interesting, of course, that's why you go to the zoo, but there's so much to, so much about a zoo. A zoo is a great place. As a landscape architect, you probably appreciate zoos for the way that they're designed, the way that oh, they absolutely. are designed for people to walk around and people uh, spaces for them to congregate at. And this is where you eat and this is where you see something. The Chicago Zoo, uh, the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It has such beautiful walkways to see the polar bear and things like that. And 
I would just appreciate the way it was made for so many people to instantly know how to navigate it. And there's so much, there's so much intelligent design in this that you can bring out. And the animals are just displays for me. And if you like to draw animals, you should draw animals. But if you don't, there's still so much to see. And I've learned that from urban sketching. <laughs> We're going to have a lot of challenges in, a, in another week. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> well, guys, that, guys, this is fantastic. I, 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 again, I want to be sensitive to time, but I, I do want us to please anyone who has any questions or, or thoughts for, for Nishant. Well, he's been so generous with his time and, and so generous with his talent. We're, we're so appreciative. So I, I want to make sure we take full advantage of him while we, while we have him. <laughs> Any other thoughts with, from the group? Well, I think it's interesting that you didn't like people, couldn't do people, and that seems to be the one thing that you draw more than anything, and you're excellent at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, I was quite convinced I'd never be able to do this. I absolutely, it, it, it broke me. I felt terrible that I'm just going to end up drawing stick figures forever, and I'm not happy with that. I want to say more things. So it's incredible. I, the, I, the fact that I could tells me that anybody can, and it's never too late. It's, it's just, you, you have to chase it in different ways. And now with, for me, that trigger was urban sketching. It allowed me, it showed me that there's a way to do it from observation. It's allowed, you're permitted to do it. That's the biggest thing. And this is a, again, a theme we often come to in the podcast is that what urban sketching communities do for us. Why does the community matter? Why does it matter to share on a Facebook group or to connect on Instagram? Is that all artists always give each other permission to do things. We have ideas, but we don't know if they're any good. We think they're just in our head and they're a little crazy and surely it won't work like that. But you see somebody do something, you see something that you look over their shoulder and they're doing it, or you see their work and you see how they might have done this, you reverse engineer it and see the steps that led to it. And that gives you permission to do that. And you know that that wasn't a crazy idea. I can try it too. And you know that, oh, maybe I have good ideas. Maybe I can trust the next idea I have without having to need permission for it. Mm -hmm. So community really helps. And it was a really big part of me learning to draw. I, I followed this person on Instagram who would do exactly this. So this is what I did. I, I, I sit at a traffic light and I draw people as they walk by. Because it's a traffic light, it's going to be 10 seconds if I'm lucky. So I never know how little time I have. I have to go quickly. These are all single line drawings. I don't even have the time to lift the pen off the page when I start on a figure. So I did this because I saw somebody do it. I saw someone do it on Instagram and share it and his page looked beautiful. And I thought this is possible. I can, I can try it. I could do that. What if I did lift my pen off the page? I wonder how it would look. It would look like this. It would become my style. But it was only possible because I saw an urban sketcher try it and he gave me permission without actually speaking to me. So I urge everybody to be part of the global community, to form your community and get all kinds of diverse people in it. Get engineer turned artists like me, get a fine artist, get somebody who works in oil, somebody who works in a pencil, and you'll find solutions to problems in different ways and different perspectives. Mm -hmm. If you think about your practice of art as climbing a mountain, there are you might reach a certain point of the way and then you have this sheer cliff in front of you. And it doesn't make sense to just climb the cliff because it's right in front of you. A good mountaineer will go around the mountain and find an easier route up. So looking at other artists, looking at people who are artists for different reasons, people who draw things other than us in styles different from us, it gives us little tips, little ideas, little solutions for little problems that, that, that are obstacles for us that we are not able to negotiate. I see somebody draw a face with just one quick oval and it tells me, you know, I don't need to draw eyes all the time. I can just draw a face like this and then get on with drawing the rest of the human body. I don't have to get stuck in get, getting that ear and those eyes exactly correct and then not have drawn the rest of the body they've already left. So it's great. To, urban sketch meets and sketch crawls are just amazing. I'm so jealous that you're able to do this because uh, we're not able to do, I'm not able to do it here because vaccination is much slower and 
it's just starting in the Chicago chapter as well. So I'm super, super envious of those guys because you learn so much. I've learned everything I've learned is from being an urban sketcher, all of it. I'm an artist because I started urban sketching. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I guess you don't miss being a mechanical engineer. <laughs> uh, I did a lot of cool things as a mechanical engineer. I, I made race cars for a few years. Uh, then oh, okay. uh, I was a biomechanical might, engineer, and we, we might have to take a little bit more time, and we might <laughs> need to hear a little bit more about that, Nishant. You can't get away with that comment yeah, and not yeah. explain a little As bit a, more about the race car thing. <laughs> yeah, and then. And I did a master's degree in biomechanics, and that was about how the human body works if you think of it as a machine. I, I can't and even spell it. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work with people who would juggle, and my thesis was about how people control left and right sides of their body in interesting ways, and I'm trying to define it and explain it as a mechanical engineer. I learned a lot of things from it. From my education, I learned, mainly I learned how to learn things. I learned that difficult concepts can be broken down into actionable goals and you can do one thing after another iteratively and get better at it. How do you approach a problem that's really big? How do you approach a problem that seems insurmountable? Like how do I learn to draw as a grown adult who doesn't? You break it down into small actionable things. You make feedback loops of things that will improve over time and inform you better and better. You source more information from around you, more inspiration, more ideas. You try different tools to find what works for you best. All of those things have come to me from being a methodically thinking engineer. Mm -hmm. So my education is always with me. It teaches me a lot. It helps me as an artist. I just don't practice it in work. I get to practice it in what I choose to draw, how I choose to draw it. Oh, man. Oh, well, you know, I, I could go on for hours, guys. Uh, <laughs> I know this is... This is if you family. have any questions, please do. Yeah. yeah, anybody have any questions? This has been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, Nishan, if you leave mm -hmm. this crowd quiet, you've, you've done a heck of a job. Man. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a typically quiet crowd, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> well, I hope you'll have a really great uh, sketch crawl after this and everybody will be super enthusiastic and maybe you'll have stuff with all kinds of different tools you know we're gonna uh we're gonna absolutely have to have to stay in touch with you and, and mm -hmm. show you our our progress as well and and, yeah. uh, and and certainly hope one day we'd love to have you as an in-person guest to join us and maybe do a little workshop with us or or, or whatever but I, I do want to plug your your podcast uh, because you you hooked me as a as a listener, mm -hmm. and it's the sneaky artist uh, for those who who love to listen to podcasts such as such as I and and Nishan suggested that you know listen to these podcasts when you're drawing, you know just put the earphones on and and, and sketch and draw and listen. He's got some some fascinating uh, uh, insight. But he also has an even uh, greater uh, gift for for uh, talking to extremely talented urban sketchers, and the lineup that he's had on his podcast have been they're the tops of, of of the urban sketcher world, and to hear their insight as well is very educational, and just their approach, the diversity and approach, and methodologies and materials, all of that is what's so fascinating about the the world of urban sketching. So this is, I, I'm going to just, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa, but I, I you know, but I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just tickled uh, to, you know, to no end, Nishant, to certainly get to know you a little better, your, your insight uh, and your philosophy on what sketching is, is fantastic. And then the world of urban sketching is, is even, is, is even broader and, and, and certainly more educational. I wrote down so many little snippets of what you said. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's been an education for me this evening uh, as well. And uh, patience, I've, I'm finding that as I get older, my patience gets a lot shorter. So I want to yeah. see something. I want to see it quick. I want to sketch it quick and yeah. I want to get out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So make it easier. Like have a sketchbook yep. like this that fits in your pocket yeah. and have one pen and make yep. I, like I have a sketchbook that so I tell students that 
make one sketchbook of only bad drawings. Call it a sketchbook <laughs> of bad drawings. Write that on the first page. I got plenty and, of those uh, anyway. <laughs> but it, it really matters that you write it, you know, in my thinking. Because if you write it, you get the load off. You don't put yourself in this pressure that I need to make a good drawing. You'll end up making really good drawings. The best ones are made when you don't think about how good they're going to be. But if you tell yourself that this is bad drawings, then anything is a subject then any amount of time is enough time. And then any style is appropriate. It sets you free. And that freedom is really, really useful. I had, a, I had an artist friend of mine one time when I took a, a course many, many years ago. And he said, okay, everybody grab your, your sketchbooks, your, your clean sheet of paper and pick up five markers. Mm -hmm. So we all picked up five markers and he said, put them in your hand that you're drawing with, pull the tops off, now drop those markers on the page and just do that. <laughs> and we did it. And he said, okay, now you're ready to sketch. So, I mean, yeah. you know, that's exactly right. Make your mistake and forget yeah. about it. Uh, you yeah. know, that's free, free yourself. <laughs> Very well said. Like in episode 10, I spoke with a, a Singapore based artist, Paul Wang, and he's yes. a fantastic watercolorist. Yes. And he sometimes starts. So it's, the things I ask people about, the things that interest me are, how do you get started on a blank page? You know, we have this fear of the blank page that you're going to ruin it. And he sometimes starts a page just by making a splotch with color yep. that does not necessarily Ooh. correspond to something, but now he has to make it work. He has to fit it some. It gets him started on the page. He's in. So he's taken the first step. He's done something that he didn't intend to do. So he's not uh overburdening himself with trying to be perfect or keeping it perfect it started with a mistake and it allows you know these kind of things that you can't control that's what it allows for a bit of magic in your work and that's really useful that's so one the one thing that you know you you heard a lot of episodes one thing i never ask anybody and i've never asked a single guest and i absolutely don't really care about the answer is what tools they use or what paper they use I never ask anybody this because I don't care. I, it doesn't really matter. The best tool, the best pen, the best paper is the one that you have in front of you, the one that you like to use. That's it. It could be a ball pen. It could be a $200 fountain pen. For me, it's been this $30 pen for the last three years. It's made me thousands of dollars and I don't need to, do, I don't need to buy a more expensive pen. So I, I ask questions in my podcast about things that make me curious. And I chase after, just like in my art, I chase after my curiosity and I push, I find different ways, different perspectives and points of view to get a nice answer out of them. And that it seems to work. I'm really happy. I've been able to speak to really, really talented people with uh, decades of experience in some cases with making art, with selling art. And you, you get so much. This is uh, the reason I started the podcast is because in the middle of the pandemic, all of these meetings had cut off. We didn't have meetups. We didn't have sketch crawls. We didn't have the right. symposium. And I had learned so much from being around sketchers. And I had just reached the point where I knew all of these guys. Like I, in the Chicago seminar in 2019, I hung out with Shari and Paul Heaston mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Marek and all of these people. And I wanted to learn from them. I wanted to get more things from them. I wanted to steal ideas from them. And it was really irritating to me that we couldn't meet. And I would be stalled. So I wanted to find a way to still extract good data, good information from them. So I said, I'm going to start a podcast because that gives me an excuse to have a two hour long conversation and to get all their good ideas. And the secondary effect is that other people will listen to it and uh, they don't have to stop either. I've, I've learned so much in four years because of urban sketching. And it's, it would be a crime if people can't also get that that learning just because of a pandemic so the podcast is there to be with you when you need to learn to draw and you should listen to it while you're drawing whether you're indoors whether you're outdoors it's a conversation just like it happens if you're at an urban sketching meetup you talk about what you're drawing you talk about why you're drawing it you ask about life you ask about how is it that they are drawing these things in this way I have some really fascinating people even in the coming episodes and I'm so excited to share those conversations soon. Uh, I was just editing one uh, just now half an hour ago before this conversation. 
uh, I don't usually tell people I don't tell people who the guests are beforehand, so I won't I won't break that here. But I learn so much from listening to them, and it's such a joy to share it because I think mm-hmm. listeners also learn a lot. I can't believe how the urban sketcher community has grown. Uh, I remember when Gabby started it, um, uh, you know, many years ago when I saw him in Chicago, I said, did you ever realize what you what you did? <laughs> you know, and he said, no, I, I never thought it would grow into something as, as monumental as, as an international group. At, at right. his, and uh, so so that's fascinating, uh, Nishan. This is this has been extraordinary. Uh, this has absolutely been extraordinary. Uh, I, I hope everyone uh, has gotten just a fraction of what I've gotten out of this. And uh, th- this has been so wonderful. I, I can't thank you enough for your time and, and your sharing, again, of your knowledge and insight. Uh, your philosophy is, is just uh, so valuable for not only the artist, but the up-and-comer sketcher and, and, and yeah. artist. Well, which I have long so, conversations with artists and sketchers. Someone's so, playing it on location art of their <laughs> modern environments. Today, yeah. I'm speaking there with Kevin Campanario, sketch journalist for the Seattle Times and Thank founder you. of the Urban Sketchers Organization. <laughs> In the USK community, most people know Gabby or know about him. But for the longest time, I only knew him in the role of founder so was, and also a sketcher. The, uh, guess? In researching this, episode, uh, some, someone's I realized playing what a disservice it would have been to speak to I him know. about only this dimension of his life. As what? I learned, Gabby has made an interesting journey to come to where he is today. Is it, is it Jill's screen? But also the unexpected yes. virtue of ignorance. What's that? Or in this case, not knowing oh. enough to not try something. Huh? This episode Who, is brought to you by... <laughs> oh, I was playing your podcast. I, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I oh. put it put it on a list to listen to. I guess it's it's playing. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, that's okay. We were wondering who the who the mystery uh, you know, podcast listener was. <laughs> oh no, I, that's Look, okay. I encourage listening to my podcast at all kinds of hours. <laughs> it's awesome. Oh. Well, look, any last questions? And then I'll turn it over to Lisa to close out. And Anna, if you have anything to say, any last questions for, for Nishant? I don't have I'll a just question. say. I don't have a question, but I, I want to let you know how much I appreciate you spending the time to be with us because that information that you've been, your insight on, on your reasoning is uh, really valuable to me. It's, it's pretty amazing. So I, I really appreciate it. I'm coming away with a lot more information. Yeah, I'm glad to have. You. Yeah, and we're going to make an artist out of Patrick yet. He's, you know, so. <laughs> I can't wait. Working on. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you, Nishan, he's, he's one of the finest artists you go around. I tell you, Patrick is extremely talented. He does some great work. Uh-huh. He's the one that's scared of the ink pen, though. Yeah, he's got to pencil everything out first. I'm going to well, get him to just now. put that pen on. Put that pen on the paper and go, man. <laughs> you helped me with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Awesome. Nissan, thank you. Thank you mm-hmm. so much. Uh, yeah. Appreciative. Lisa, I'm going to let you wrap this, wrap the session up and, and uh, I'll be quiet. But man, I'm, I'm pumped. I'm ready to go outside like right now. And it, as you can see, it's dark behind me now. <laughs> me too. I'm ready to go outside too. Nishan, thank you so much. Uh-huh. I, you have opened my eyes to things that I just were, that should have been right there for me. They just weren't. And I'm, I imagine all of you have gotten the same thing that I've gotten out of this. Um, thank you all for coming and all your new members for coming. And um, Nishan, I hope we can have you again. Yeah. Um, yeah. maybe in six months or so and yeah, then uh, maybe we will have um, all grown from what you've said and uh-huh. uh, show you new work that we've done so yeah thank you so much. yeah thank you for having me this was this was a great time it was it absolutely was anybody else want to say anything i would just thank you thank you thank you <laughs> yes, thank you very much.
Thank and you. I want Help me a lot. Special thanks, special thanks to Anna too, because she's the one who reached out to Nishant and, and uh, got him got him on board. Great job. Absolutely. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> thanks, Anna. Thanks, all of us. Hey, we're, we're, we're going to look forward to seeing everyone in a, in a week and a half or so at the zoo, if not sooner. And uh, Chris, it's great seeing you and Katie down there. And, and uh, I expect to see you at the, at, at the zoo as well. And bring Karen as well. And, and uh, we're going to have a fun time, guys. We're going to have a blast. Lisa, thanks for setting it all up. Nishant, you are awesome, dude. <laughs> Thanks so much. We Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. See you next time. Bye, y'all. Good night. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.